Greetings, time-traveling thinkers and modern-day explorers. I'm David Lee, your host on Timeless Talks. And in this Who is Who episode, we embark on an extraordinary journey through the corridors of history, with none other than the enigmatic Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Are you ready to unlock the secrets of the past and delve into the depths of philosophical brilliance? Well, fasten your seatbelts, because we're about to take an electrifying ride with one of history's most influential minds. Together, we'll peel back the layers of time to understand the motivations, discoveries, and even the not-so-perfect moments that shaped Rousseau's legacy. Get ready to challenge your perspectives and embrace the boldness of thought as we encounter the man behind the ideas. Let's start. Would you please introduce yourself to our audience? Greetings, dear audience. I am Jean-Jacques Rousseau, born on June 28, 1712, in Geneva, Switzerland. My childhood was marked by challenging circumstances, as my mother passed away shortly after giving birth to me, and my father's absence left me in the care of others. During my youth, I developed a keen interest in literature and philosophy, and my passion for education led me to Paris, where I immersed myself in the world of ideas. Over the years, I traveled extensively and lived in various places, seeking intellectual growth and inspiration. My journey has been one of introspection and contemplation, shaping my philosophical outlook and propelling me to write influential works such as The Social Contract and Emile. I am humbled to have played a role in shaping the discourse on societal and political theories. Through my writings, I sought to challenge conventional beliefs, envisioning a more idealistic society built on the principles of freedom, equality, and direct democracy. My reflections on human nature and the concept of the noble savage have sparked both admiration and controversy, as they challenge established norms. I stand before you today, not as a perfect individual, but as one who has grappled with the complexities of human existence, hoping to inspire others to question, reflect, and engage in the pursuit of a more just and harmonious world. Let's continue with the basics Sean Jack. Your ideas on the social contract have been influential, but some critics argue that your vision of the state of nature is idealized and unrealistic. How do you respond to those who challenge the foundation of your theories? When it comes to the social contract, I understand that some may perceive my vision of the state of nature as idealized. However, I must emphasize that my intention was not to present a utopian view but rather to explore the fundamental principles underlying the social contract. In my work, The Social Contract, I propose that individuals in their natural state are free and equal, yet they willingly enter into a social contract to establish a just society. While critics may argue that this notion of the state of nature is too simplistic, I maintain that it serves as a conceptual framework to understand the origin of societies and the need for cooperation among individuals. Admittedly, I may have painted an optimistic picture of the state of nature to illustrate the potential goodness of humanity. Yet, I am fully aware of the complexities of human behavior and the challenges that arise when individuals interact within societies. The social contract theory provides a foundation for discussing governance, rights, and responsibilities, but it is not without its limitations and criticisms. I welcome healthy debates and constructive criticisms as they lead to a deeper understanding of our social dynamics and offer opportunities for refining and enhancing these ideas. Ultimately, my aim is to encourage individuals to reflect on the nature of authority, the role of the governed, and the balance between individual freedom and collective well-being. By engaging in these discussions, we can collectively shape societies that better align with the principles of liberty, equality, and justice. Throughout your life, you expressed a deep love for nature and a desire for a more natural way of living. Yet, you famously abandoned your own children, raising questions about the consistency of your beliefs with your actions. Can you shed some light on this aspect of your life? My love for nature and my philosophical contemplations often centered around the idea of returning to a more authentic and natural way of living. However, I must admit that my personal life was not without its contradictions and complexities. The decision to entrust the care of my children to others was undoubtedly one of the most challenging and regrettable aspects of my life. It is true that I found myself torn between my desire for a simple, solitary existence and the responsibilities of parenthood. My philosophical musings on the state of nature and human freedom clashed with the practicalities of societal norms and obligations. In my defense, I believe that by distancing myself from my children, I could spare them the struggles and hardships that often accompany social conventions. I held a somewhat idealistic view that they might be better off without the constraints of conventional upbringing. However, with the passage of time, I came to recognize the gravity of my decision and the impact it had on my children and their well-being. My actions were not in harmony with my ideals of nurturing the natural innocence of childhood and fostering loving family connections. 
I beard the weight of this contradiction and acknowledge that my life was indeed a complex tapestry of philosophical exploration and personal struggles. It was through introspection and self-awareness that I aimed to reconcile my beliefs with my actions and seek a more authentic alignment between my ideals and my choices. This introspective journey serves as a reminder that even great thinkers are bound by the human experience and must grapple with the complexities of living out their convictions. My hope is that my reflections on this matter can inspire others to examine their own lives and strive for a more congruent existence, where philosophy and actions are intertwined in a more harmonious union. Your works, such as Confessions and The Social Contract, have sparked intellectual discussions and inspired generations. However, some have criticized you for your controversial ideas on education, particularly your proposal to send children to a public establishment. Could you elaborate on your educational vision and how it aligns with your broader philosophy? My vision of education, as laid out in Emile, indeed sparked both admiration and criticism. In this treatise, I sought to present an alternative approach to education, one that honored the natural development of a child and respected their innate curiosity. My proposal to send Emile, the hypothetical pupil in the book, to a public establishment was not an endorsement of conventional institutions. Instead, it was a reflection of my belief in the importance of social interactions for a child's growth. In such an establishment, Emile could experience real-life situations, interact with other children, and learn through practical experiences, all while under the careful guidance of a tutor. Central to my educational philosophy was the idea that education should be tailored to the individual needs and capacities of the child, allowing them to develop at their own pace. I emphasized the significance of hands-on learning and direct experiences, encouraging Emile to explore and learn from the natural world around him. Critics have pointed out that my approach seemed unconventional and even radical for its time. Yet, I firmly believed that traditional education often stifled individuality and creativity, leading to the suppression of a child's authentic self. By advocating for a more personalized and nature-oriented education, I aim to liberate children from the constraints of societal norms and nurture their innate talents. However, I must acknowledge that my vision of education was not without limitations. The question of how such an individualized education could be practically implemented on a larger scale remains a challenge. Moreover, the role of gender and social class in my educational vision has been scrutinized, as it reflected the norms of my time. In essence, my educational ideas were intimately connected to my broader philosophy, which emphasized the importance of human freedom, authenticity, and the need to challenge the existing societal structures. While my approach may not have been universally applicable, I sought to inspire contemplation and encourage a re-evaluation of conventional educational practices. My intention was to ignite a dialogue on education that fosters critical thinking and encourages a more enlightened and compassionate approach to nurturing the next generation. Your advocacy for direct democracy and individual freedom has had a lasting impact, but some argue that your ideas are too radical and impractical for modern governments. How do you envision your principles being applied in today's complex political landscape? Indeed, my advocacy for direct democracy and individual freedom has been at the core of my political philosophy. While some may view my ideas as radical or impractical, it is essential to recognize that they stem from a deep concern for human liberty and the pursuit of a just society. In envisioning the application of my principles in today's complex political landscape, we must first acknowledge the unique challenges faced by contemporary societies. The scale and diversity of modern governance require thoughtful adaptation and refinement of political ideas. Direct democracy, as I envisioned it, involves active citizen participation in decision-making, fostering a sense of ownership and responsibility for the common good. However, in large and diverse societies, achieving direct democracy in its purest form might be logistically challenging. Nevertheless, the principles of citizen engagement, transparency, and accountability can still be incorporated into representative democratic systems to enhance people's participation and ensure the preservation of individual freedoms. It is also crucial to recognize that my ideas were grounded in the context of my time, and applying them directly today might require adaptation to address contemporary complexities. The role of technology, for instance, presents opportunities to increase citizen engagement and foster a more informed electorate. Furthermore, the concept of the social contract, where the legitimacy of government emanates from the consent of the governed, remains relevant. In today's world, Governments should continually strive to align their policies with the interests and values of the people they serve, fostering a sense of collective identity and unity. While some may view my ideas as idealistic, the pursuit of a more just and egalitarian society should not be abandoned. My philosophical approach aimed to challenge existing norms and inspire critical thinking, 
and that spirit continues to be relevant in contemporary politics. In summary, adapting my principles to modern governance requires thoughtful consideration of the unique challenges we face today. My ideas on direct democracy and individual freedom can still serve as guiding principles to enhance citizen engagement, promote social cohesion, and work towards a more equitable and just society. As we navigate the complexities of the modern world, it is vital to remain reflective, thoughtful, and open to exploring innovative approaches that uphold the values of liberty and equality. In Emile, you emphasize the importance of natural education. However, critics argue that your ideas might lead to an isolated and sheltered upbringing. How do you respond to these concerns? My intention was to promote a nurturing environment that allows children to develop freely and authentically, unfettered by the constraints of societal norms. However, I understand the concerns raised by critics about the potential for isolation and sheltering in such an upbringing. It is essential to recognize that my vision of natural education is not about complete isolation from the world, but rather about providing a carefully guided and purposeful learning environment. While I emphasize the importance of hands-on experiences and learning from nature, I also acknowledge the value of social interactions in a child's development. Children should have opportunities to engage with others, learn about different perspectives, and cultivate their social skills. It is true that the implementation of natural education requires careful consideration and a balanced approach. Striking a harmonious blend between fostering individuality and encouraging social interactions can help avoid the pitfalls of isolation. Moreover, my ideas on natural education were influenced by the context of my time, and I recognize that the modern world presents unique challenges. Today, incorporating technology and diverse educational resources can enhance the learning experience for children, ensuring they are well prepared to navigate the complexities of contemporary society. While critics raise valid points, my vision of natural education remains grounded in the belief that fostering a child's innate potential and curiosity can lead to a more fulfilled and well-rounded individual. By addressing concerns and adapting the principles to the realities of the modern world, we can create a more nuanced and practical approach to natural education. My aim is to encourage dialogue and thoughtful consideration of educational practices that best serve the growth and development of the next generation. The path to a well-rounded and fulfilling education lies in striking a balance between individual growth and social engagement, enabling children to become active participants in society, equipped with both independent thinking and a sense of community. You once stated, man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains. Yet, your critics argue that your ideas could lead to chaos and anarchy. How do you strike a balance between individual liberty and societal order? Hmm, a profound question. The quote you mention, man is born free, and everywhere he is in chains, captures the essence of my belief in the natural state of human freedom and the constraints imposed by society. The tension between individual liberty and societal order is at the heart of my philosophical inquiry. I contend that a just society should preserve individual freedom while maintaining a collective sense of responsibility and common good. To strike a balance between these seemingly contradictory elements, we must recognize that true freedom is not an absence of restraint but rather a harmonious coexistence between the individual and the community. In my work, The Social Contract, I propose the concept of the general will, which represents the collective interests and welfare of the entire society. It is through the general will that legitimate governance arises, where decisions are made in the best interest of the community as a whole. Individual liberty must be harmonized with the general will to avoid descending into chaos or anarchy. In my view, each individual must willingly submit to the collective decision-making process to preserve the unity and stability of society. By doing so, individuals surrender some of their natural freedoms in exchange for the protection and benefits of living within a well-ordered community. While my ideas may have been seen as radical in their time, they underline the need to find a balance between individual rights and the broader social fabric. My vision seeks to create a society where all members feel invested and included, allowing the general will to express the collective aspirations and desires that safeguard the common good. Nonetheless, I am well aware that achieving this balance is no easy task. It requires open dialogue, respect for diverse perspectives, and a willingness to engage in the democratic process. The general will can only emerge when each individual participates actively and thoughtfully, allowing the collective wisdom to guide decision-making. In summary, the tension between individual liberty and societal order is an ongoing philosophical inquiry, transcending my time and resonating with contemporary challenges. Striking a balance necessitates embracing the complexities of human nature and the dynamics of collective governance, where freedom and responsibility intertwine to build a just and cohesive society. 
My aim has always been to provoke contemplation and stimulate discourse on these vital matters, fostering an enlightened and engaged citizenry capable of navigating the delicate interplay between freedom and governance. Your writings often explore the concept of the noble savage, but this notion has been criticized as romanticizing indigenous cultures and ignoring their complexities. How do you address these critiques and refine your views on different cultures? Your inquiry is perceptive. The concept of the noble savage indeed holds a prominent place in my philosophical discourse as it reflects my idealistic view of the innate goodness and simplicity of humanity in its natural state. However, I acknowledge that this notion has faced criticism for potentially romanticizing indigenous cultures and oversimplifying their complexities. Upon reflection, I recognize the limitations of my perspective. While my intention was to highlight the virtues of simplicity and freedom from the corrupting influences of civilization, I must acknowledge that indigenous cultures are rich and multifaceted. Their societies are shaped by their unique histories, beliefs, traditions, and interactions with their environments. By placing too much emphasis on the idealized, noble savage, I may have inadvertently overlooked the complexities and diversities inherent in different cultures. It is essential to understand that each society has its distinct customs and values, which deserve thoughtful consideration and respect. I now realize that embracing cultural diversity requires a more nuanced approach. Rather than homogenizing and idealizing indigenous cultures, it is vital to engage in genuine dialogue, learning from their experiences, and recognizing their contributions to the world. As a philosopher, it is my duty to continuously refine my views and engage in self-critical examination. Through introspection, I strive to acknowledge the limitations of my own perspective and seek a more comprehensive understanding of different cultures and their unique contributions to the human experience. In essence, my philosophy should not be seen as a rigid framework but rather an evolving journey of intellectual growth. By recognizing and addressing the criticisms directed towards the concept of the noble savage, I hope to foster a more profound appreciation for the diversity and complexity of human cultures and promote a spirit of cultural humility and understanding. The goal is to transcend simplistic notions and cultivate a broader perspective that celebrates the richness and uniqueness of each cultural tapestry within the grand mosaic of humanity. By doing so, we can foster a more inclusive and harmonious world where diverse cultures coexist, enriching each other with their respective wisdom and insights. Throughout your life, you held a complex relationship with religion and spirituality. Some have accused you of undermining traditional religious beliefs. How do you see the role of spirituality in society? And how do your ideas reconcile with conventional religious practices? It is true that throughout my life, I pondered deeply upon the subject of religion and its relationship with the human experience. My thoughts on spirituality were indeed multifaceted and occasionally challenging to the conventional religious beliefs of my time. As a reflective thinker, I sought to explore the essence of spirituality beyond rigid dogmas and established institutions. I believe that true religiosity lay not solely in adherence to external rituals but in a genuine connection with one's inner self and the natural world. The contemplative tone of my writings reflected my introspective approach, encouraging individuals to delve into their innermost thoughts and emotions, seeking a deeper understanding of the human condition. My philosophical musings led me to embrace a more personal and individualistic spirituality. I recognized the importance of inner virtue, moral conscience, and a sense of empathy as fundamental aspects of spiritual growth. The idealistic and visionary elements of my philosophy found expression in my belief in the innate goodness of human nature, emphasizing the potential for personal growth and self-improvement. I must admit that my ideas on spirituality occasionally provoked controversy and challenged established religious norms. My thoughts on the social contract and the relationship between religion and the state were indeed radical for my time. I envisioned a society in which religious freedom could coexist with civil liberties, where individuals could pursue their own spiritual paths without coercion or imposed orthodoxy. In addressing the role of spirituality in society, I sought to strike a balance between individual liberty and communal cohesion. My contemplative and thoughtful approach urged society to consider how spirituality could foster moral virtues and contribute to the common good without becoming a source of division or conflict. It is crucial to understand that my philosophical reflections were rooted in a quest for a just and harmonious society. My intention was not to undermine traditional religious beliefs, but rather to encourage critical thinking and self-exploration in matters of faith and spirituality. In reconciling my ideas with conventional religious practices, I acknowledged the significance of social bonds and the role of shared beliefs in fostering a cohesive community. 
While I advocated for a more individualistic approach to spirituality, I also recognized the potential for collective rituals and traditions to unite people and strengthen their sense of belonging. In conclusion, my philosophical journey on spirituality was one of introspection, contemplation, and idealism. It sought to inspire individuals to embrace a deeper connection with themselves and the world around them, while also encouraging a harmonious coexistence of diverse beliefs within society. By fostering a thoughtful and informed approach to spirituality, I hope to contribute to the greater understanding of the human condition and the pursuit of a more just and enlightened society. Your ideas have undoubtedly left a profound mark on history. However, some critics argue that your influence has had negative consequences, particularly in the French Revolution. How do you reflect on your impact on later events and the course of history? To contemplate the consequences of one's ideas on the course of history is a weighty matter indeed. As a reflective thinker, I am aware that my writings and philosophies have had a profound impact on subsequent generations, particularly during the tumultuous times of the French Revolution. My thoughtful and informative contributions to political and social theory, including the social contract, undoubtedly sparked discussions and debates that played a role in shaping the intellectual climate of the era. The radical and visionary nature of some of my ideas, coupled with their controversial elements, indeed contributed to the fervor and zeal that characterized the French Revolution. It is true that the revolutionary period witnessed significant upheaval and turmoil, as well as unintended consequences that were far-reaching. The provocative nature of my works and their challenge to established norms and authority might have played a role in fueling the rebellious spirit of the time. However, as an intellectual and philosophical thinker, my intention was never to advocate for violence or upheaval. I believed in the idealistic vision of a just and free society, grounded in individual liberty and a collective social contract. My aim was to inspire individuals to critically assess the existing social structures and contemplate alternative ways of organizing societies that could respect the rights and freedoms of each individual. The French Revolution, as with any historical event, is a complex and multifaceted phenomenon, shaped by numerous factors beyond any single individual's influence. While some critics attribute negative consequences to my ideas, others see value in the principles of individual freedom and direct democracy that I championed. As a contemplative philosopher, I must acknowledge the limitations of my own understanding and the unpredictable nature of historical developments. While I cannot control how others interpret or implement my ideas, I remain steadfast in my belief in the power of reason, critical thinking, and informed discourse as essential tools for societal progress. In conclusion, I recognize that my ideas have had both positive and negative effects on history, and I take responsibility for the potential repercussions of my philosophies. The complexities of historical events call for continued reflection and examination, inspiring future generations to seek a balance between intellectual inquiry and the pursuit of a just and equitable society. And there you have it, fellow seekers of knowledge. Our journey with Jean-Jacques Rousseau comes to a close. But the adventure doesn't end here. Remember, the past's wisdom is a guiding light, illuminating a path through the labyrinth of today's challenges. Thank you for joining us on this daring exploration, and remember to subscribe to Timeless Talks, to continue uncovering the brilliance of history's greatest minds. I'm David Lee, your audacious moderator, urging you to stay curious, stay bold, and let the echoes of the past propel us towards a brighter future. Until next time, my fellow time travelers, keep questioning, keep learning, and keep embracing the power of Timeless Talks.